Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andy Katz. I'm a senior product manager at AWS. Uh, I'm here today to talk to you about a new service that we launched this morning uh, that you may have heard of. I'm assuming you did because you're here. Uh, it's called uh, AWS Step Functions. And I'm going to talk to you about it today um, about its use cases. And a uh, higher level introduction, I don't know if some of you saw the serverless talk earlier this afternoon. This is going to be at a little different level, and we're going to talk about different, uh, different usage patterns. Uh, so the talk, I'm going to talk, cover four topics. Uh, one is, you know, what is AWS Step Functions? I'm guessing a lot of you have an idea, um, but we'll talk about it for those who didn't catch the announcement this morning, the three of you. Um, talk about how does it work? How do you use it, actually? What does it look like in use? Then we'll address the question of why use it. Uh, what are the kind of uh, situations where it might come in handy? And, and what can you do with it now? What's available today? So first question, what is AWS Step Functions? It's a curious name. So we'll begin with this notion of um, moving from monoliths to microservices to functions. And, and this is a journey that many of you are already underway. Maybe you're thinking about starting today. Uh, but the idea is that applications are starting to get built on a, what I consider more human scale. Uh, the idea is you know, the firm's like this big monolith, but within the monolith, there are departments. There's finance, there's manufacturing, there's HR and whatnot. Um, and within those departments, there are people. And then people in their day do tasks. And so it kind of makes sense to have software mirror that to some degree. And, and you can think about that pattern of going from an ERP package to breaking it up into individual functions for finance, for inventory, for manufacturing, but then break it down even further and make it a series of even smaller services or even functions that do something like help handle the sales team. But it also makes technical sense because breaking up applications this way gives you greater flexibility for change, makes your applications more resilient, they are more durable under failure, they scale more easily. You can move the parts and pieces independently from each other. Um, but this introduces a challenge, uh, and that challenge is how do you keep track of the movement of information between all these microservices and functions? Um, it's called keeping track of state. What is the state of the process that is being executed by the system? And so that's where step functions comes into play, is it's intended to make it easy to coordinate the different components of distributed applications and do it in a visual manner with visual workflows. And we'll, we'll tell you what that means. So we'll take a moment, because I want a souvenir. So give me a second. I'm going to ask everybody to say cheese. Thank you. That looks good. I'm going to send it back to the team. Now, why did I take a picture? Well, one, I did want a souvenir um, to remember today uh, so I could share that with our team. But also to talk about the kinds of things we might do with this photo that I just took. Because suppose we were building a photo sharing site. Uh, what might we do with the picture? Well, one thing is we'd upload it to the site. And then once we get to the site, we want to do things like transform it. We might convert the file type. So suppose my photograph is a raw file, it's huge, and I want to make it smaller. So I want to convert it to something like a JPEG or a PNG, or I want to transform it to a TIFF for other, other reasons. So I might have a process where I say, select which image converter do I want to use, send the file to that image converter, not the others, convert it, and then put it in the database. And if I selected the wrong image type, like I said, make this a PDF, and it says, I don't know how to do that, it needs a graceful way to say, can't be done, sorry, try again. Uh, and so the workflow looks like something on, on, uh, on the left. Or I may take this picture and I want to do things like extract the metadata. Where was this picture taken? Um, what was the date? Maybe what was the weather? What was it recorded by the camera? I may want to resize into a thumbnail so I have different, different formats. And I might want to pick out the faces so I can tag them later. But I don't need to do these things sequentially. I could do these things in parallel. Uh, and so what I really would like to do is take that image, divide it across different paths, and do them all in parallel, and then bring it back together, and then put it in the database. So parallel image processing. So these are common patterns that, uh, that people want to do. And these things, what they have in common is, I might do this not for one photo, but for hundreds or thousands of photos. We all take lots of pictures, uh, especially on vacation. And so when you think about frequently repeated processes, things like generating reports, or fulfilling orders, or processing data, or automating our infrastructure. Uh, these are things that we do over and over again, patterns and small bits of work, but many, many times. And so then the question is, how do I do it? So I ask, are these things you ask? I want to do my services in a particular sequence the same way every time reliably. Or I want to run things in parallel. Or do you want to pick paths based on previous results? So if A, then B, but if B, then C, and choose the branch you go down. 
if there's a failure, do you want to be able to retry automatically so you don't just die on the, die on the vine? Or sometimes you have code that just runs for hours and you want to know when it's done. You want to make sure it gets done, but you want to know when and you don't want to babysit it. These are the kinds of tasks you're looking for, then step functions um, may meet your needs. So it's a new tool for your toolkit. And the intent is that it's actually simple enough to use in, in, in lieu of scripts. So a lot of us have built a script that's designed to last for a week and ends up lasting for a year and then beyond. Because somehow it moves from being a script to solve a problem this week to becomes the application. Step functions is a way to actually do that instead of scripts that, that can actually grow into the application if it needs to. Um, and it's just as easy. But on the other hand, it's also robust enough to build and operate at scale. At its core uh, is a technology that it has in common with another Amazon service called Simple Workflow, which is durable at handling billions of workflows at scale every week. And so you can trust it for the simplest things to the most complex projects um, in, in, both, in both small and large. So the benefits we hope you get from it are, are threefold. One, we want to make you more productive. We want to make it easy to connect and coordinate these applications. And we'll show how to do that so you can create apps quickly and focus on what makes your app different, not worrying about the plumbing underneath it. We want to make your apps more agile. We want to make you uh, able to diagnose and debug problems faster in these apps by giving you transparency into what's going on in a distributed environment, uh, but also make your apps adaptable to change, be able to change individual microservices or individual functions so that your app can grow and evolve over time with your business needs. And finally, we want these things to be resilient um, so that you can handle at scale uh, without having to worry about underlying, managing the underlying infrastructure, whether you, know, you need to scale it or fix it or patch it, whatever. You don't worry about that. We do. Um, and also, you want it to fail gracefully. So when tasks don't work, when things like network connections in the outside world get severed, you want a way to handle that gracefully, recover, and keep going. So with that premise, let's talk about how does step functions actually work. So the application lifecycle uh, has three basic steps. First, we use state machines. So the metaphor is a state machine to define how you want things to execute. We define them in JSON. And why is JSON's you know, common, common, common uh, definition? And it's declarative JSON. So it's almost human readable. You can follow through the code. But of course, not everybody is a coder. And sometimes you want to talk to people uh, in your company who doesn't read code, but they're a visual thinker, and they understand logic. So you can show them um, what you, the, the diagram in the center, the flow chart, or the graph of the state machine. And the graph is generated automatically by step functions. So you present it with the JSON code, it generates what you see in the console. That information is used not just for talking about what does the state machine look like, but you can actually use that to monitor your executions. So we'll talk about that in more depth, but the idea is that when you're running state machines, and you can run many of them at a time, you can look at each one and ask what's happening inside the state machine. We use that as visual feedback of what's going on in your execution. And we'll look at each of these uh, a little more closely in a moment. So step one, define your state machine in JSON and visualize in the console. So what you're seeing on the left um, is the JSON code, almost human readable. Um, this generates a classic hello world pattern that you see on the right. So what's on the left generates on the right. We basically specify what state do we start in. We define the state. And we say, where do we go next? Either it's the last state, we call it the end. Or we say, what's the next state? And name it and go to it. And that's when we build state machines. And we have um, a several types of states to build more complex state machines than just a hello world that does one state and calls it a day. Now, I'm going to be talking a lot about individual state machines. Um, and single executions of these machines. But what I want to clarify is that the power of step functions is you define a state machine once, declares a type, and then you can run thousands and thousands of concurrent executions. Uh, so this allows you to break big tasks down into a series of smaller tasks and just launch a flight of them uh, to break down problems quickly. So an individual execution being monitored from the console looks something like this. And this console provides all kinds of information. What I want to say is anything you see in the console with the exception of the graph, is accessible from the API. So I'm showing you things in a visual console, but you can rest assured that in a programmatic environment, you can call things. And I'll talk about that a little bit uh, as well. So let's talk about the elements of this console. So first, if you look uh, in, the, in the upper left, you see the graph. You see a tab, graph and code. So you can toggle back and forth between that graph and the JSON code that you wrote to define that graph. So you can look and say, what is that state doing in more detail? Um, during execution, it's color-coded. 
So states turn blue when they're work in progress, they turn green when they're successful, they turn red when they fail, and if there's a retry, they'll turn yellow. So you can actually visually see what path your execution is taking and took during, during an execution. Um, in the box on the upper right, you see execution details. You get a general overview of the state machine. You get its name, it, they get assigned an ARN, uh, an Amazon resource number as an identifier. Each execution also gets assigned an ARN, this Amazon resource number, so you can identify them by, by type and by instance. Um, when they started, when they closed their execution. And that's important because executions can persist up to a year per, per state machine. There's two other tabs, input and output. So you give input to your state machine, and again, in the form of a JSON document, uh, key value pairs, they can be nested, uh, so the full JSON syntax goes in. That information is passed to each state in your state machine and used to process, and it passes back a result that either modifies the key value pairs or adds key value pairs to the JSON document. And at the end of the execution, that becomes your output, and you can look at that in the tab as well. That's the input and the output of the whole state machine. If you look at the tab below that says step details, you can also step through individual states and in the same way see the input that went to that state and the output that came out from that state. So if you have an unexpected behavior, you have a way of tracing through and saying, where did something change that I didn't expect and debug faster. <coughs> Finally, at the bottom, what you see uh, is a complete history of the execution, step by step. Um, with timestamps. So you've got a full history. This is useful for debugging in detail. It's also useful for keeping logs when you're in a compliance situation uh, and you need to keep records for, say, a regulated environment. And again, all these things can be um, gathered through the, through the API as well. You can also monitor your execution through Amazon CloudWatch. So we emit information to CloudWatch. You can make graphs. This is an example of a different state machine. Uh, the blue graph is the actual Lambda functions getting, getting launched. They're about 70 per minute getting, getting set out. And then uh, each Lambda function is executing in about two to 300 milliseconds. So you can monitor your executions um, in this way. Similarly, you can also send information to CloudTrail. Now, AWSF function supports seven state types today, task, choice, parallel, wait, fail, succeed, and pass. Tasks do your work. They're the workhorse. They call on your application components, your microservices. Um, and there are two kinds of task states today we'll talk about. One is push, one is pull. Um, and they, and they, um, they work both with AWS resources and your own compute resources. Choice states allow you to add branching logic. Parallel states are how you fork and join information across different paths. Wait states let you put in timers. Uh, fail and success end executions with information. So if they fail, you can have richer information about what went wrong in the execution. And pass state is really a development tool. It passes input to the output. So it's used as often as a placeholder before you hook in your resources in your state machine. So it's an easy way to build something quickly, mock it out, and see it looks the way you want it to look. So we'll look at each of these in a little more detail. So task states, again, are your, are your workhorse. And they pull or they push. So if you push, push synchronously calls a Lambda function, passes the, you know, the input that the state has to that Lambda function, it processes the work, it returns the result back, and the Lambda function goes away, and the state machine then passes that output to the next state as its input. Okay, so that's the simplest pattern. And that's when we talk about serverless applications, Lambda is kind of the workhorse. But one thing I want to be clear is serverless application development step functions is one way to use step functions, but there are others. The other is anything that computes. Uh, in this paradigm, we use uh, a, what's called a long pole. And so it can be an AWS uh, EC2 instance. It can be a container. Um, it can be an on-prem server. It can even be a mobile phone. Basically, any compute device that's on the internet that can make an API call to step functions can request work, receive it, perform it, and return a result. And so the basic long pole pattern is um, when you're defining your, your task state, you register an activity type that states recognizes. When you write a program on that compute resource, you, you tell it to present that ID as this is the kind of work I know how to do. And essentially, your, your computing instances call in to, to step functions and say, do you have work for me? Do you have work for me? Do you have work for me? And they basically hold the poll open you know, for a minute at a time. And if the state machine enters a state where that work is needed, it gets dispatched to that machine, performs the work, completes it, sends it back, and then forgets about what it did. Because the whole idea is that all your, your uh, compute resources remain stateless. Step functions keeps track of state. So what does a task state look like? This is our hello world example again. If we look inside a little more deeply, um, every state has a type. This is a type. We declare task. Now it knows it's a task state. 
task states require a resource. Um, and so in this case, we give it the arn of a lambda function. And so when step functions hits this state, it's going to call that lambda function um, that, you've, that you've written described elsewhere. And while you're doing this in the console, it'll actually give you a drop-down list of the lambda functions that are available in the region you're working within as a convenience. Um, alternatively, if you're in a long pull into this, into this task state, then that arn would be replaced by what's called a registered activity. You'll go to the console or you can do it through the API. You say, I want to register an activity. You give it a name, it gives back an arn. You put that arn in the resource, and now when, when step functions reaches this state, it waits for one of your activity workers, one of your computers, and one of your programs to call in and say, I'm looking for this kind of work, do you have it? And when there's a match, it gets dispatched to the, comp to the compute resource, processed, and sent back. Now, there's some other nice features about, about task states, one of which is they will retry when there's a failure. Um, and so here's a snippet of the code. You essentially indicate the kind of error you want to handle. So if an error comes back at you, um, you can say, for this handled error, handle it this way. And so you can say, try again how many times? In this case, two more attempts. So three strikes, you're out in this, in this state. How long do you want to wait? So this says, wait a second. But maybe you want to wait longer and longer intervals. You want to have an exponential back off um, if you have a resource that's, that's being latent. So you can specify a back off rate, and you'll increase how long you wait each successive try. Uh, until you get success. So that's a, that's, a, um, that's a retry. The other scenario is you get error codes and you can catch failure of task states. And so here's the same notion. So now we introduce the, the phrase catch under the task state. We make an array with different kinds of error messages. There are two kinds. There's a custom error, which you see is the first error. And the second is a reserved error. There are four reserved errors. They begin with the word states. So there's a task failed or a task timeout. Um, and so you have a combination of, of uh, reserves error types and custom error types. And based on those error types, you can choose what state to go to next, which means that if you're trying to say, uh, look up something in a database and the database isn't available, you can go to a state that handles that problem. Uh, and we'll show you some examples of that in, in a bit. So this lets you implement a well-known pattern that, are, that is used in a lot of programming language you know, called try, catch, finally. And that's just built into the service. So when you have a catch failure, your state machine looks like this. So within that hello world example, where we don't, if we have a retry, we don't see it, but if we do have catch states, the states that we go to show up in your state machine because you have to have a destination for each of those catch states. Choice states give you branching logic. So choice state, you specify type choice. Um, and then you have comparators. And so the comparators can be strings, numerics, booleans, or timestamps. You have uh, the full range of greater than, less than, equal to, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. Um, and what you do is the variable calls the path of your JSON input. So that's the key of a key value pair. In this case, the key is foo. Um, and the, and the, each comparison says, is this comparison true? If so, go to that state. And if not, go to the next comparison. So this first comparator is saying, does the, does the numeric of foo equal one? If yes, go to the first match state. If no, go to the next comparator and keep working your way through until you've exhausted all the comparisons you've set up. And if all those fail, you can specify a default state, which says, if none of them match, go to this state because there's a problem in, in the execution. And that's what you see in the state machine on the, on the right, which is that choice state goes to first match, a second match, or a default. And so that's how you can handle um, branching logic in, in step functions. Parallel state, uh, similar construction, but it lets you fork and join processes. So you specify the state type parallel. You can see it's, it's stated there. In this case, you'll tell it what's the next state at the end of all the parallel execution. So where does it all get joined? It gets joined in the final state. And then the branches of the parallel execution get defined. So you say, where does each branch start? What state does, this, does, the, does the branch start at? So the first branch starts at wait 20 seconds, and it's a wait state. Um, the second branch says it's a pass state. And, it would, and, and so as you define each of these branches, you get a state machine that looks like this. We put the uh, parallel branches in a box, so you can see that it's a parallel set. And the idea is that that input gets copied across all the branches, goes down through the branches, and then the results are brought back together in an array and put in that, given that final state as its input. And so I want to make a distinction. When we talk parallel, we're talking about executions inside the state machine. We're talking about many state machines running. We talk about concurrent executions. Um, and, there's, and that's important because there's issues about how uh, names are handled in a state machine execution versus inside a state machine execution. Wait states are pretty straightforward. They're timers. 
Uh, so you can have a time in seconds, or you can have a time based on a timestamp. And so you can uh, make your state machines wait. Everything I've shown you now is in the console in the blueprints. So you want to see the code in detail. You want to modify the code and play with it. Um, these are the six that we have today. We'll have more in the future. Uh, but we have the basics, the hello world, the retry and catch, parallel states, the choice states, and wait states. And so you can experiment and learn uh, as you go. As I mentioned, you can also use this through the API. And the API is really simple. It's basically five basic calls. One is create things. So create a state machine. You upload your JSON and give it a name, and you've registered a state machine type. You can also register your activity workers the same way. Say, I have an activity worker, and I want to give it this name. And it says, OK, you have a name, and here's your ARN. Now you put that in your state machine. Uh, so you can imagine a world where you register activities and can build state machines programmatically, as well as by hand. Start executions. Tell it which state machine you want to run, and it returns an execution ID. You can specify it yourself, or it will assign one for you that's um, a random number that's item potent. You can also stop an execution at any time. So if it doesn't get to the finish line, you can just kill it. Uh, you have lists, so you can list all state machines, all executions, and all activities that are in the system at any given time. You can also ask it to describe individual state machines, individual executions, uh, and individual activities. And that's basically it for the API. It's very straightforward. So now the question is, well, OK, this is how it works. Well, why should you use it? Where should you use it? So we'll talk about a couple of customer examples. So we talked about ensuring tasks execute in sequence. So what if you were to want to reliably process orders? So an example of this is a company called Food Panda. Uh, Food Panda has a food delivery service uh, that works globally and basically connects restaurants with customers that order food by managing a delivery network. And, and what they need to do is when orders come in, they need, to, they need to group these orders by drivers, by region, and make sure that they get the food to the customers in the shortest time possible in the most efficient manner. They're solving the traveling, traveling salesman problem over and over and over again. And so this naturally lends itself to a state machine. So Food Panda build a state machine to handle the pairing of drivers with orders. So it starts with telling me what vehicles are available now that are not doing delivery, that are in, in the zone that I'm interested in delivering food to. Based on the available vehicles, they run an assignment algorithm uh, that, that says th these orders in this car, those orders in that truck, and these orders in that van. And then they dispatch the vehicles to, for delivery. And of course, something may go wrong. So they want to know if they get a hold of the vehicle, great, tell the customer the food's on the way. If the vehicle is not available, they have a failure mode that says, I can't get a hold of the vehicle, so I have to put it back in the process and reassign it again later. Um, and in some cases, all the vehicles are out, so they have no vehicles found in the very first step. Uh, so this is a way of having the pattern of, of making sure there's, there's vehicles, that there's matches, that there's availability, and that customers get informed. And all these things have to happen in a predefined sequence. You don't tell a customer food's on the way if you don't know that it's sitting in the vehicle. And so this is an example of, of ensuring tasks execute in order. Uh, another example is the take. So suppose you want to choose logical paths based on data. Um, example is reliably curating a database. So the take is an interesting company. The take lets you discover products in TV shows and movies that you're watching. So if you see the actor wearing an interesting watch, you know, or a certain pair of shoes or a dress, and you say, I want to know where I get that, the take lets you find out. Uh, but to do so, they have to have a database of all the items they've tagged, and they need to keep it up to date for when things um, are out of fashion and no longer available, for when prices change, for when inventory changes. And so they have a database they want to keep fresh on a regular basis. They used to do this manually, and it was very painful. They have hundreds and hundreds of products to keep track of. So instead, they built a state machine. And the thing is, their state machine is an example of a choice state, because they work with a variety of vendors. And so the first question they ask in the database is, where did this item come from? Which vendor, A, B, or C? And then based on knowing which vendor provided that item, they'll launch a Lambda function that then goes and communicates with that vendor's database and says, is this stuff available? So it makes a smart decision about how to communicate with which database. And if it turns out that the information is not available, they, they have a problem communicating with the database, they can reflex to a screen scrape, capture the information that way, and update their product, uh, their product catalog. And that's an example of using branching logic in a, in a state machine. Now, these are a couple of good examples of how customers are using step functions. I could go in depth uh, on these, but I'd actually like to go in depth on one more example. But rather than have you hear it from me, I'd like you to hear it directly from a customer. 
So I have with me today Manuel Pata from OutSystems. And Manuel is the team leader of the Cloud Automation Group. Uh, and he's got a really good story about how they addressed what I think is going to be a common challenge for a lot of people in coordinating microservices. And, I'll let you and what I'm going to do is let Manuel tell you more about OutSystems and about their experiences with Step Functions. Manuel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. So don't leave right now. I think I also want a souvenir. Oh, <laughs> more pictures, sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, if you will nice indulge us. <laughs> mm, good. All right, thank you. So, hello everyone. My name is uh, Manuel Pata. I work at uh, OutSystems. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, OutSystems, let me do you a brief introduction. Well, OutSystems is the number one low-code development platform on the market. This uh, low-code uh, term was, was coined by, by Forrester to designate our, our space. So what does it actually mean? Well, it means that instead of writing code, we use, uh, use visual models to create web and mobile applications. You might also have heard of terms like rapid application development. Uh, well, that's, that's our space. Um, when we talk about these uh, local platforms, people usually think about toy applications. No, we are actually delivering mission-critical enterprise-grade applications to our customers. We are enabling them to easily go to, to market with their, their applications. So. <clears throat> Sorry. So, OutSystems uh, delivers a, a full-stack visual development, a full lifecycle life cycle management, and also uh, the ability to deliver your application to almost any device. But enough about our systems. Uh, let me tell you a story. In late 2014, uh, we shifted from a product-only company to, to an hybrid product and hosted services provider. So we started to deliver our platform on the cloud, on the AWS uh, cloud. This enabled our customers to not worry about installing software to have uh, running uh, their own infrastructure and th that kind of, of stuff. It enabled them just to write the, their applications, just to develop their applications using out systems and not to having to worry anything at all. And this helped us to move a bit faster so we could deliver uh, more value to our customers in less time. Besides that, it also opened a new door at our company. This, this door, we call it microservices. We started to explore microservices earlier this year, and uh, our first service, our first microservice, was a mobile application builder. I don't know, those of you who are aware of uh, developing mobile applications know the hassle of installing uh, the development environments, having different hardware to compile for a specific uh, vendor. And, well, that's a lot of trouble. And we want to deliver value to our customers. We don't want to give them another problem to, to solve. So we created this mobile uh, application builder. Well, this was a very interesting move for, for us. But we knew that we'll get into some problems in the, in the future. We had some, some problem, a big one. It was about consolidation. When you go into to microservices, you start having team developing their, their own services and their, their own logic and, uh, well, you have to monitor those systems, right? Otherwise, your customers will call you and say, well, this is not working and why it's not working? Our support and operations teams have no idea why this is not working. So monitoring was a challenge because we had, we had to consolidate all this information from multiple event sources like uh, CloudWatch, like Zabbix, like our own applications. And well, we had no, no way to do it out of the box with uh, commercially available solutions. We also wanted to integrate something that's very important for us. That's our business logic. It's not just uh, that the service is down, but the service is down and what is it affecting? And uh, is anything related to the service that uh, is also down? Should we trigger an alarm? Shouldn't we? Well, we were aware of um, AWS step functions better, and uh, we saw that as the missing piece for, for our puzzle. And, well, AWS step functions uh, as a very simple language, but at the same time, it's very, very powerful, you know, because 
you can build very complex logic with this, uh, with this simple language. Let me go over the, the requirements. Well, our new monitoring system, it had to be reliable. So we had to, to, to be able to count on it. it we didn't want the, the boy who cried wolf story anymore. It's, it's very important to rely on your monitoring system. So it had to be always available and we had to be able to trust it. Also, it had to be scalable. It had to grow with us. As we have more and more customers with, in our patch offer, uh, we need a system that scales with us, and we don't want to worry about uh, provisioning EC2 instances or going uh, uh, to work on auto-scaling groups. We want to do it uh, without thinking much about it. Also, it had to be highly available. It's our monitoring system. It's our eyes on the, the infrastructure. We, we need to, to see all the time. It's not something that we can afford to do an operating system upgrade. It goes wrong and we have no monitoring system or that uh, uh, an available design becomes unavailable and our instances are down, so it had to be always on. And this is the most important uh, thing uh, that I want to, to talk to you about. It had to be easily, easy to extend. That's crucial, because when you go to, to microservices and you have different people de developing different services, it's very important to get people on board, that people collaborate with you w in your monitoring system. And step functions allowed us to do that. And it allows us to do that in a very simple manner. OutSystems understands what uh, simplicity looks like and how hard it is to, to achieve, and we recognize that right away on AWS Step Functions. AWS Step Functions allow people to view just the logic, to understand the logic. People don't need to know how to code. They, they can, but they don't need it. But everyone understands logic. Not everyone understands code. So, enough talk. Let me go through a, an, a state machine that we created for our monitoring system. For those of you in the, the back rows that can see it very well, well, I, I'll walk you through, through it. It's very simple. It starts with a couple of tasks. Those are the ones in the states in, in black, in black boxes. These tasks retrieve some information using uh, lambda functions, and then we get into a choice state. This choice state will verify where our event came from and what it is about and we'll pick a different path regarding uh, the event source. As you can see, we have multiple choice states on this uh, state machine, and we also have something that uh, Andy talked to before. We have this uh, try-catch, uh, finally, pattern on all our uh, uh, Lambda tasks. So this is very simple, and it's quite simple to, to go to a support team or to an operational team show them this logic and then explain them why something failed or why, why something is, is not working. So it's very easy to explain and that's very important for us in our system. Well, how does this look like? Well, it's just this. It's just a very simple JSON document that if you don't want to type it, you can also have a, a tool to generate it for you or I think it's something that will come in the, the near future. People will start building tools to, to generate these uh, state machines. It is very simple. So it's our choice state. It evaluates a, a variable using JSON path. It's a string equals Zabbix, and if it equals, it's a, an event of type alarm. So that's really, really simple. That's what we wanted to achieve with step function, simplicity. Now, what were our results and achievements with this, with this experience? First of all, we were able to earn trust. Trust is something very difficult to, to earn. It's uh, something that we value very, very much. And with microservices, you have like uh, 10 or 20 teams developing different stuff. And it's all fine and it's very interesting. You can uh, innovate in a very quickly, uh, very fast way. But when it comes to your operations and, and support team, it gets messy. So if these teams, they, they understand how, how the team implemented the, the monitoring, well, they can trust the team, they can trust the monitoring. And it, this will build a better relationship between the, the operations and the, the development. Also, this, this, this enabled us to, to grow faster also. And uh, we feel safer in this growth because, well, we know what's happening. Uh, we know that AWS Step Functions uh, is uh, an highly available service. It's, uh, it's very interesting. And it also scales in 
without really having to, to worry about it. So we can, we can grow, it's very, very quick to, um, to extend, to explain to another team, well, this is how you write a, a state machine, so implement your logic. We can integrate it uh, very fast because we don't have to go truly to, to the, through the code. We just can look at the logic and see if it makes sense. Everyone understands logic. And that's something that we value very high. So, thank you. Thank you, everyone, Andy. Thank you. Also, a special thanks to, to Andy, who was of uh, great help through this, this journey on a list of functions about the program. You're welcome. Thank you. So thank you, Manuel, for telling us your story. Um, I think, um, for us, it's very interesting because OutSystems really is the expert on making people productive, agile, and resilient uh, in a low-code setting. They know what simplicity looks like. And so it's actually quite thrilling for us that they looked at AWS Step Functions and felt that they found something that could work for them in their development environment that was as simple and direct as we hoped. So let's talk a little bit uh, to wrap it up. Well, what can I do today? Most of the stuff we talked about. Um, so we talk about the features of AWS Step Functions. We want to make you more productive. And so we think the, J the declarative JSON lets you be more productive. It's a more intuitive way to define a workflow in the form of a state machine. Uh, we want to make it easy to work with whatever compute resources you have, whether it's a Lambda function, a container, an EC2 instance, your on-prem server, you know, even to the extent that your mobile phone has an SDK, your mobile phone. Um, we give you branching logic for choices. We give you fork and joins for parallel processes. We also want to make you agile. Um, so we give you the visual console so you can step through your state machine executions and learn what's going on. We give you the history of each execution in detail so you can keep, keep records as well as find, find where the gremlins hide. Um, integration again with Amazon CloudWatch and AWS CloudTrail, so not just the console. Um, and we want to make sure that your apps are resilient. So we take care of scaling automatically from a single execution a day to tens of thousands per day. Uh, we have that try-catch finally pattern, which is make sure that every task actually executes when you want it to and gets to completion. Um, you can time out tasks. So if you have a long-running execution uh, and, and a particular task is supposed to take 10 days, um, you can wait 10 days. And on the 11th day, you can say it's done. But 10 days is a long time to wait to find out something can work. So we also have a feature, and they're called heartbeats. So heartbeats are where um, that compute instance that's calculating for a long period of time can call back in every minute, every five minutes, every 10 minutes. When that heartbeat disappears, you know something went wrong in that compute instance, you can fail faster. So if you have a 10-day compute, and there are companies, customers of ours that have had 10-day compute in their, in their workflows, um, you can find out if it failed on day two or day nine, and start it again if you have to. So how much does it cost? Uh, it's two and a half cents per thousand state transitions. So we measure state transition by looking at those arcs on the graph. So start into the first state, trace your path through till you get to the end. You count those up, you get, uh, you get the number of state transitions your execution completed. And it's the path that your execution follows, not the number of paths you create in your state machine. So a lot of times, like when you saw a Manuel state machine, uh, it had you know, on the order of 20, 25 different states, but the path that it would take through to complete an execution you know, might be uh, five or six. We also have a free tier associated with it. So 4,000 state transitions per month are free so that you can experiment freely without fear of uh, having a bill for the service of any kind. So where can you get it? So we launched today in five regions, uh, the, the common ones. Uh, so US East in North Virginia, also Ohio. Uh, US West in Oregon. We have EU Dublin. And we have uh, Asia Pacific Tokyo. Uh, all those are available today. Uh, so if you go to your console, you can just drop down to whichever region you prefer to work in and find step functions there. So how to get started. So you can get started the classical way. And so the classical way is, well, read the documentation. Uh, there's a developer guide. We have an API reference. There's also two other documents, one of which is a specification of the state's language, if you just want to see the nuts and bolts of, of that language, uh, each, of the, each of the state types. Um, but we also have a, a static code evaluator called StateLint that's on GitHub. So when you write your code, you can check that it's syntactically correct before you upload it into the service. So all those are available. Or you can simply go to the console. 
Uh, and so if you go to uh, awsamazon.com step functions, you can come to the console and you can look at those templates and start building state machines um, by just poking your way through the service. And, and our belief is that you'll be able to put together a simple hello world in a couple of minutes, uh, either with a pass state or if you have a Lambda function available, you just set up some IAM permissions, we help that uh, make that automatically and press go and you're running a state machine. So with that, I will say thank you. I appreciate your time today. Um, please complete evaluations. I will take questions out in the hallway in a, in a moment. Um, and related session, if you have a time machine, you can go back and see it, but this happened earlier this afternoon, um, focused on serverless apps uh, with step functions, but these will be online, so um, you may wanna look for this one in the future. Again, thank you very much.